Welcome to Five Side Chat. My name is Sai. I am excited to reveal the fire checklist that I created, and it is completely free for you to use. If you follow me on Facebook or Instagram, then you probably saw the checklist far in advance. So in this video, I'm going to break down the 10-step financial independence checklist that I created, which can help you on your fire journey. And you can download this PDF link in the description below. With that said, let's get right into it. Step one is to calculate your financial independence retiring early number or the fire number. This is the step that will probably take you the longest to figure out. So let me walk you through the step. Your fire number is your total annual expenses multiplied by 25. So for example, if your expenses will be $50,000 a year, then you multiply that by 25 and it gives you $1.25 million. That is your financial independence number. Your fire number really depends on how much you want to earn passively when you retire early. This is when you and your spouse need to have a conversation about how much you want your expenses to be when you retire. There are different types of fire like lean fire, traditional fire, and fat fire. Lean fire is for people who are willing to live a minimalist lifestyle to cut expenses in retirement. Typically, your retirement expenses will be anywhere between $30,000 to $40,000 a year. So your fire number will be anywhere between $750,000 to $1 million. Traditional fire is for people who are willing to live anywhere between fifty to I would say $75,000 a year. And these numbers really depend on where you want to retire. If you subscribe to my channel, one of my future videos will be about how to pick a location to retire early. So your fire number will be anywhere between 1.25 million to $2 million. So again, depending on where you want to live when you retire, these numbers will depend on your total annual expenses. Fat fire is for people who are able to retire without altering their current standard of living. My family and I are on a fat fire journey, and this strategy requires us to have the most aggressive saving and investment plans. Your fat fire number could be anywhere between $2.8 million to $4 million if your expenses would be about $100,000 a year or more. Here are the expenses you need to consider when you calculate your fire number. Keep in mind that you don't include any debt like student loans, car loans, or credit card debt when you calculate your expenses. So category number one is housing. You want to keep these expenses as minimal as possible, so somewhere between 15 to 20% of your income. Lower the better. So these expenses are things that we absolutely need to keep a roof over our heads. Our current housing expenses are mortgage, property tax, homeowners insurance, and the HOA. We want to have our mortgage paid off when we retire. So if you stay until the end of this video, I'll talk about that in step 10. Category number two is your utilities. These are the expenses you need to keep your house running. Take a look at your bills like electricity, water, gas, sewage, trash, internet, phone, subscriptions, and cable TV. Category number three is your food, including your groceries, beverages, and dining out. If you're on lean fire, then you might only consider groceries as your essential expenses. If you're on the fat fire, then you want to be more flexible with your food spending. So if you spend $20 a day on food, then your monthly uh, food bill is $600 a month. Category number four is transportation. So no matter where you retire, you will need to get from point A to point B. We break our transportation budget down to gas, maintenance, car insurance, and DMV registration. Category number five is your medical, dental, and any other healthcare expenses. You should know how much your out-of-pocket costs are going to be for the insurances that get you carry. Some prescriptions might require you to pay out-of-pocket. If you have term life insurance, then you should include it in this category as well. Category number six is your miscellaneous spending like personal care, gifts, clothing, hobbies, pet care, and anything else that you want to add to your spending during retirement. By the way, this video is sponsored by my own website, firesidechat.com. You can schedule a free one-on-one 20 minute financial coaching session by visiting firesidechat.com slash coaching. Step number two is to have your emergency fund up to your deductibles. So what that means is that you have your deductibles covered if any emergency happens. And if you got into a car accident, you would need to pay the deductible for your car insurance. If you went to an emergency room, you would need to pay deductible for the medical insurance. If you don't know what your deductibles are, make sure you contact your insurance carriers. I would say it's anywhere between $500 to $2,000. We'll talk about fully funding your emergency fund in step five. Step number three is to contribute to your retirement up to your employer match. And if you don't have this option, then you'll skip this step. If you don't know if your employer offers a match to your employer-sponsored retirement account, 
you should contact your HR or the brokerage company. For example, if your employer matches your personal contribution, if you contribute, let's say, uh, 6% of your income, then that's all you want to contribute to your retirement plan in this step. If you make $100,000 a year, then contributing 6% would be $6,000 a year. But if your employer matches 50% of your contribution, then that's extra $3,000 a year in your retirement account. You should never leave free money on the table. Step number four is to pay off your debt, except mortgage. This is the step where you pay off your debt as quickly as possible. You don't want to spend four years, five years, or 10 years on this step number four. If you do, then it defeats the purpose of getting on the financial independence journey and then retire early. You should also not start the step until you complete your first three steps. Take a look at your current finances and see what kind of debt you're currently paying off. You could have credit cards, personal loans, car loans, and student loans. You have two methods to pay off your debt, and that's the avalanche method and the snowball method. The avalanche method is to pay off your debt by listing them by the highest interest rate to the lowest interest rate. If you're using the snowball method, then you list your debt from smallest to largest by the balance. Let me give you a quick example. You have $15,000 in credit card debt at 20% interest rate, $10,000 in car loan at 3% interest rate, and you have $20,000 in student loan at 7% interest rate. If you're using the snowball method to pay off your debt, then you pay off your debt in this order, $10,000 in car loan, $15,000 in credit card debt, and then $20,000 in student loan. If you're using the avalanche method, you pay off your debt in this order, your credit card debt with 20% interest rate, student loan with 7%, and then your car loan at 3%. You can check out the detailed video I did on paying off your debt video link in the description below. Step number five is to max out your emergency fund. Now that you have your deductible set aside from step two of this checklist, you want to have at least three to six months of your expenses set aside in your emergency fund. You should also have your monthly expenses figured out from step one by calculating your uh, fire number. If your monthly expenses are $3,000 a month, then you want to have $18,000 saved if you're the sole provider in your household or $9,000 if you're a dual income family. You should also consider saving extra cash for a family emergency if your family lives far away from you. You can check out a detailed video I did on the emergency fund and I will put that link in the description below. Step number six is to max out your IRA and HSA. For 2022, the maximum contribution to the IRA is $6,000 or $7,000 if you're age 50 or older and HSA is $3,650 or $7,300 if you have a family plan. Also keep in mind that you can contribute to your spouse's IRA if he or she is a stay-at-home parent. This is called a spousal Roth IRA. So bottom line is, if you're married, you could contribute up to $12,000 a year in two separate Roth IRAs and $7,300 towards your HSA. If you're single, then you could contribute up to $6,000 a year in a Roth IRA or $3,650 a year in an HSA. For the HSA, I would create a separate savings account to save extra cash for your medical expenses. So you don't withdraw from your HSA. People on the fire journey don't touch the HSA. Instead, they invest that money into an investment account. You want to save every medical receipt so you can later withdraw from your HSA completely tax-free. HSA is like the combination of a traditional IRA and a Roth IRA. It has triple tax advantages that will lower your taxable income, grow your investment tax-free, and you can withdraw from it tax-free as long as you provide your medical receipts. When you turn 65, you can directly withdraw from HSA for non-medical expenses, but you will have to pay federal income tax. You can check out these two detailed videos about Roth IRA and HSA. Step number seven is to max out your employer retirement plan. So in step three of this checklist, I talked about contributing up to your employer match. Max out your 401k, 457, TSP, 403b, or any other employer-sponsored retirement plans up to 20,500. If my employer offered a Roth option, then I would contribute all 20,500 towards my Roth 401k or the Roth TSP. The employer match is not included in that 20,500. For example, if I contribute 20.5% of my income towards my 401k and my employer matches 4% of my income, 
then I would have 20,500 of my personal contribution and $4,000 of the employer match in my 401k every year. That's a total of 24,500 into my employer retirement plan. Keep in mind that if you're age 50 or older, then you can contribute an additional $6,500 a year to your 401k as a catch up contribution, which totals $27,000 for the year 2022. Step number eight is to achieve 50% savings rate. And let me give you some scenarios with $100,000 in gross income. If you're single and under 50 and you're maxing out your IRA, HSA, and 401k, that's already saving 30% of your income towards retirement. You will still have an additional 20% to save and that can be towards your taxable brokerage account on the high yield savings account. It really depends on what your, your savings goals are going to be. You could be saving for real estate properties, new cars, travel, or maybe a wedding. If you're under 50, married, and you're the sole provider for the household, maxing out your IRA, HSA, and 401k will put you in the 40% savings rate just for your retirement. That might make you feel like it's too much for $100,000 income. This is when I would go back to step seven and hold off on maxing out the employer retirement plan until your income goes up. What you don't want to do is to tie up all your money in retirement because then you don't have a lot of room to save for other expenses that you want or need. If your household income is $200,000 a year, then that puts you in a 20% retirement savings rate. Remember that your goal is to save as much money as possible to retire early, but don't tie up all your money in your retirement accounts that you don't have immediate access to. You can always go back to step seven of this checklist until your income goes up. You can check out my detailed video about how to build a retirement portfolio link in the description below. Step number nine is to build generational wealth. By the way, if you made it this far in this video, thank you. And don't forget to subscribe for more fire videos. This is where you should think about creating a trust, investing in real estate, the 529, UTMA, UGMA, or other investment assets that you can pass down to your children or grandchildren. Now, people might argue that we should invest for our children before we invest for our retirement. I would argue that you should always, always prioritize your retirement over your kids' college savings. You're going to need significantly more money for your retirement than your kids' college tuition fees. Not that I'm telling you or your kids to borrow money for college, but they have the ability to work their way through college and pay for their own tuitions. You, on the other hand, do not have the ability to borrow money to live on for retirement. That's why this checklist prioritizes your, your retirement from steps one through eight and then builds your generational wealth in step nine. The final step is to pay off your mortgage. The beauty of owning a home is that your house will build equity over time. So your 15 or 30 year mortgage payments will eventually become cheaper over time. Our house, for example, was $180,000 in 2014, and now it's worth over $360,000 in 2022, while our mortgage payments remain the same at $900 a month with less than 3% interest rate. When my wife and I turned 50 years old, our goal is to not owe any mortgage for our primary home. That's because at 50 years or older, we want to significantly reduce our risk in the stock market and real estate. Now, I'm not encouraging or discouraging people from paying off their mortgage early. I know that people argue about investing instead of paying off mortgage early is the better way to go. What I'm trying to say about this step is to reduce your risk by paying off your mortgage before your early retirement so you could free up extra cash flow for you to save or spend on something else. My wife and I want to prioritize peace of mind when we're in retirement. So with that said, I appreciate you watching my video. Don't forget to check out these two fire videos and my social media pages. I hope to see you in the next video. Have a good one.